Thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. It's a pleasure. And, um, you know, uh, I was just thinking, when we're often sitting, you know, on these discussions around marketing, uh, we often end up talking about trends mostly. Uh, and these trends are all around uh, the way technology has changed and, you know, how it's impacting marketing and what are the advancements. And in marketing also, there are lots of shiny new toys, if I can call them, you know. Uh, there's, of course, uh, data, there's social marketing, uh, and so on and so forth, you know, which keep coming in um, uh, different waves and bursts, which we all uh, end up using. And obviously, you know, as uh, businesses are transforming with themselves with this advancement in technology, the marketing functions also have to transform themselves. And uh, no wonder why I see a lot of marketers spend a lot of time uh, understanding these technologies and seeing how they can harness them best uh, to build uh, customer preference and loyalty, you know, with these technologies. And all is right there. But having said that, this often, you know, uh, ends up being a distraction in our efforts to, if I may say, uh, build marketing campaigns and strategies with a purpose. Uh, and, you know, it's good to remind all of us as marketers, I would say, from time to time, that the fundamental reason that marketing exists is to add value to all its partners, whether it's employees, uh, other partners, and, of course, customers. And on that note, I really want to kick off this uh, discussion, and I'm going to start off with Girish first. Uh, Girish, of course, uh, you know, it's all about creating value for the customers, etc. And uh, to do that, uh, to be able to build your strategy, first part comes with understanding the customer, and so much is changing. So how do you keep a tab on the customer needs, preferences in this ever-changing world? Thanks, uh, Rubina. So yeah, of course, um, I always believe that marketing is the growth engine of any business. Uh, sales uh, responsibilities primarily uh, you know, uh, uh, include putting the products in the counter, but it's marketing and, you know, getting your marketing elements right that actually helps in driving business. And to get your marketing piece right, the first building block is to understand what the customer wants. Uh, understand where the customer's aspirations lie, what the customer uh, is motivated by, and, you know, things like that. And honestly, it's not a very easy answer uh, to keep, keep tab on the consumer preferences because they're changing drastically. But, of course, we have a lot of tools, but as a marketer, I'd still go with a lot of gut. And as a marketer, I would always believe in meeting people personally. Uh, there's a lot of data, there's data overload, and you can get a lot of information on, you know, e-commerce trends and, you know, on digital trends. And you can see, you know, who's buying what, who is likely to buy your brand, finally bought some other brand, are they preferring this over that. But I think the best way to keep a tab is to meet people. Meet your consumers. Uh, personally, and I make it a mandate for all my team members to go and at least, you know, have a mandate of 100 visits a quarter, right? Where you go and meet channel partners, meet consumers, understand what ticks them. Uh, you, you get a whole lot of information by those uh, chats, like chai over charcha from that perspective. So I think as marketers, we've got to keep our eyes to the, our ears to the ground. We've got to understand what's changing. We owe it to our company uh, to, you know, be that because we're going to drive business growth eventually. It's not the sales team, it's the marketing team that's going to you know, finally drive that. So that's the way I would uh, think so. Of course, a lot of data overload. You can look at all those filters, cuts, but meet people personally, there's nothing to beat that. Absolutely, Girish. Uh, data's all there to support, but you need the insight which you get through, I think, the personal touch. That's the point you're driving home, which is true. And uh, Dipali, moving on to you next. Uh, I know you've been in various industries through your career, and I'd... I'd love to understand from you that, you know, how do you create uh, value for customers? Does content play a big part? Especially, you know, it's great to meet customers in person, but today if you are to do it in scale, uh, digital offers a medium. So do you do a lot of uh, content and want to be, you know, maybe sharing your experience as a brand, as a, uh, a knowledge provider? Does that help create some sort of value? Absolutely, uh, Rubina. Uh, I think if I look back in a technology brand's life, of course, where I am at IBM, uh, and especially with the kind of complex technologies that we deal with, I think uh, educating the customer uh, is a key part of the uh, brand uh, uh, agenda. 
Hi, Ajay. So I think, and it starts from absolutely right about, uh, you know, looking at what we're doing in the R&D space, uh, taking the new ideas to them, uh, making them aware of what the new world of future is going to be like, you know, to doing, let's say, white papers, to doing use cases, to, you know, uh, working with our clients over a long period of time to see transformation happening in their businesses, which in turn transform the lives of the end customer. You know, so that's a whole cycle that technology companies will, you know, follow through depending on wherever they are and, you know, whatever is the job that they're doing. And this could be B2B or this could be B2C. So I see some of the B2C technology companies, uh, you know, actually opening out the minds of the, uh, you know, end customer too. Now let's look back at financial services where I worked. I think there again, a huge task has been done over the last two decades by financial services to educate the customer. I remember 10 years ago when we started out in health insurance and auto insurance, auto in this country has never required education because it's mandatory. But health insurance was such an uphill task and you've been there with me, right? Uh, today, 10 years later, when I really look at understanding of, you know, what term life insurance is, what health insurance is, things have changed for the betterment of the customer and brands collectively, industries collectively have played that role. Look at the campaign that Amphi does on the mutual fund side, right? So education has been part of, uh, you know, what the brands ought to do. Even when I was at Mahindra Holidays, and, uh, you know, while you may think that in, on the tourism side, you don't require, uh, you know, education, the customer will go and find content on their own, not true. I still remember when we were doing the content strategy, uh, you know, back in those days in 2015, Food was not a leg that had been discovered by the brands in terms of the content strategy. And I distinctly remember the trend was just taking off, right? And food has, now just look at the food experiences that today various brands offer, even holiday companies offer and tourist destinations offer. So those are the changes that are happening. Yes, when it comes to, let's say, detergents or, uh, you know, some of the other commonplace commoditized kind of areas, we may not have education and thought leadership as a role to play, but I think, uh, there again, if you start looking at the D2C brands today that are coming up, be it skincare, be it organic food, uh, you know, be it healthy living and eating, you will find that some of those brands are taking, uh, you know, the edge off the traditional brands on account of them driving thought leadership and education. Uh, so that's my two piece on this. No, that's true. I completely agree with you. But you think doing this kind of content also gets some kind of customer preference uh, you know, do brands, uh, do customers start preferring those brands who do this content better than the others? Does that happen as well? I think over a long period of time, and uh, you know, I joined IBM three and a half years ago, uh, and that's what I mean by long, uh, uh, long period of time. You may not see results in a year, uh, and I know a lot of us are driven by annual budgets and brand relevance score moving, you know, last year versus this year, but if, you ha if the organization has the patience to be committed to a certain idea, uh, then you will see that change happening over 24 to 36 months. You will see the needle moving in the direction that you want consumers to think. So for example, responsible AI as a concept, you know, four or five years ago, people were just talking about utilization of AI and application of AI, right? But today when you go and speak to CXOs inside organizations, CEOs and boards, they all understand the context and concept of responsible AI, right? And that has happened only because technology companies have taken the responsibility of educating them. If we hadn't done it, that conversation would not have started in the boards and in the CEO's, uh, you know, rooms. So it's a long road and you have to be consistent at it. Get the message, Dipali. Ajay, moving on to you. Um, how are you, you know, you're, you've got a group of companies uh, under you with different kind of uh, portfolios. So how are you creating value for different sets of customers and how you bring it together as a group? So, you know, I, I just want to wear the hat of a customer and say that what brings me to a brand? What brings me to a category? And I think the simple answer is what we say, WIFM, what's in it for me? If a brand can communicate to you in a few words, what's in it for me, you will win the business and you will retain the business, to use the agency speak. And let me give our health insurance example since uh, uh, that's what we heard, heard just a minute uh, uh, before. Deepali talked about health insurance. I think the COVID taught us that a category which was insurance, life or health, which was perceived to be a push category, 
we were always told from day one, it's a push category, it's not a pull category. It suddenly became a pull category. What made it a pull? Because the customer realized the what's in it for me, and he said, I am interested in knowing more, now tell me what do you have to offer. And at that time, if a brand decides to go with the right product at the right time, through the right channel, I think he has an edge. Keeping the analogy going that if you look at financial service or health insurance, unfortunately we feel that sale ho gaya, abhi kya baaki rahe gaya? Insurance premium is only due after one year. You have to find ways to engage with your customer and therefore I feel today every category, including financial services categories, including the subcategories of financial services, have to think of themselves as an experience category. Give me an experience that I can remember and I will stay with you. Otherwise, promiscuity is the order of the day. Uh, very, very well said. Uh, Ajay, I couldn't agree more with you. Keep it simple. Uh, show the brand promise to the customer. Keep the customer first and then you know, create that pull. Absolutely agree. Sagar, coming to you uh, next, and I read your lovely blog, which was so insightful, so thanks for sharing it with me. And, um, you know, the interesting um, uh, thing that I was wondering while reading that was that, uh, especially uh, new age customers, right, which are short on uh, patients these days, they're also very discerning and sort of uh, critical, right? They can tell about between advertising and what goes behind the brand and, you know, uh, they're not as trusting, if I can just put it simply. How do you, uh, you know, bring forward uh, the brand purpose and, you know, kind of convince them on the brand purpose? I think uh, uh, the, the new age customer or the millennial or the Gen Z that, that we speak about, uh, I, I believe that they are more gravitating towards the purposeful brands than say our generation was, right? People who were born pre-1990. Uh, there are a couple of reasons. I think our generation was all about struggling, doing better in life. I think this is an entitled generation. Now what happens, like say you say Maslow's hierarchy of need, right? When all your needs are satisfied, you move to the next level, right? And I think that's the reason why, why I think the consumers really want to take stance for the brand which stands for higher thing. Now there are multiple examples. I mean, uh, it could be a higher stance, it could be a differentiating product, it could be a reflection of what the customer is. Like every time an Apple iPhone uh, new version is released, look at the queue, right? You know that, you know, you get a similar looking, similar feature product at one third of the cost, but look at the queue, right? People are, people are there through the night. You go to, people are paying four times the price for a Starbucks coffee, right? You, I mean, you know that, you know, same coffee, like 100 bucks, but 400 rupees. Because I think somewhere people are buying into the philosophy of your brand. And uh, uh, purpose. Uh, definitely goes far beyond, I would say, uh, uh, a proposition, right? So you, you say that in marketing, first is the future, second is the proposition, I think purpose sits on the top, right? And I think uh, any organization which has a very strong grounding in the purpose will have an advantage. And one of the reasons why purpose, uh, I, I would say, as, as you had said, shiny new toy, and it has been a shiny new toy for the last seven, eight years or so, and there are still very few examples of brand which have been able to do it well. And you know, every single case study we will talk about the same brand. People will talk about Dove, people will talk about Surf Excel, people will talk about Tata, people will talk about Starbucks, right? There are very few brands. I think one of the reasons is that uh, the way we should look at purpose, I think uh, we haven't cracked. The first and foremost thing which is very fundamentally different about purpose than anything else in marketing is that purpose is inside out. Everything else that you do in market is outside in. That means you listen to the consumer, you ask the consumer what would you like to, you know, for my product to be doing. I think in purpose is not that. Your consumer will never tell, say for example, no one would have told Steve Jobs that you finally need a product which doesn't have a keypad which can you which you can express. Or no one would have told Howard Schultz saying that you can sell a coffee at 400 rupees. It's a third place where it is, you're not selling coffee, you're selling an experience, right? So first thing is that if you are talking about something which is inside out, right? That's one fundamental thing. Second thing I think is uh, it has to be core to what you do. If you are a sh say sugar drink and you start say that Ki, I will, I will, uh, you know, will make peace and bring world peace. I think consumer can really see through it, right? So, so it has to be very consistent with what as a brand you could do, right? What uh, uh, you know and being authentic. And the third and most important thing is that you have to be committed to the purpose at a very long time. 
Because if you are standing for something, the purpose will start giving you any results after 9 years, 10 years, 12 years, right? So that means you have a very strong commitment. Hence, you need a very strong not-to-do list. So every purpose is very polar purpose. Like you say, look at, uh, say, a brand like Nike. There's so many campaigns, there's so many controversies, but at the same time, there are people who take stunts. So, you know, and, and that, that, that is true about brands. Like, say, when we built Tata Sampan as a brand five years back and, uh, you know, it has, I would say, it has been reasonably successful. There are two things that we said. We want to make sure that every Indian should get the authentic nutrition to the everyday food that you can consume, right? Now, that meant two things. First thing that I could never talk about non-Indian food. I know oats is going to become big. I will never talk about oats because it, it, it doesn't stand for it, right? Second thing I say, nutrition. That means I will not do something which is non-nutrition, non-authentic, right? So every time you are wanting to say something, you also have to say what you are not going to do, right? So I, I think if you really get a heady mixture, and I won't say that uh, uh, I would have got it right all the time, but I think if, 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 if you know the pathway, I think, you know, a purpose will give a strong advantage which will be very difficult for your competitors to copy. Thanks for sharing that, uh, Sagar. And I want to toss it over to uh, Siddharth and ask him, in your category, which is highly competitive, do you think um, you know, building a brand purpose over a long period of time is viable? And how do you do? If so, how do you do it? I, I mean, it's, it's very interesting, because you wouldn't um, think that it is, given the experience of what airlines have gone through in the last 10 or 15 years. And I think that's almost what makes it essential and prime for, for a first mover to take advantage of purpose. If you look at what Sagar was talking about coffee, and you see the prices of how coffee have moved from the 1960s to today, when it was a commodity to when it's become an experience now, um, airlines have gone in exactly the opposite direction. They used to be an experience, and they've become commoditized now. Uh, and it's, it, I mean, I, I blame airlines for having done that. Yes, there's been a democratization of air travel. Uh, yes, there's been all of that, but beyond a point when you start treating the consumer as an input in a process uh, and you start looking at efficiency metrics versus creating value for the customer, uh, then you become commoditized. And if you become commoditized, you're losing the opportunity to make a margin. Um, and it's like the e-commerce category or telecom or any of these other categories which have essentially become about discounting and price cutting. And what happens over a period of time is you see that uh, it's not sustainable. And if you have a purpose, then what you're able to do is actually define a value proposition which the consumer over a long period of time is going to be willing to pay a premium for. Uh, and that is what will keep you going over, as you know, we've said, it's, it's not a short-term game. Yes, if I do a sale today, obviously we'll, you know, we'll sell more uh, flights or we'll have more bookings, but that erodes value for the consumer ultimately because you know everything uh, moves around that and so does competition and the whole market. Uh, but ultimately the organization stops looking at creating value for the consumer whether that's in personalization of the experience, in the service standards that you're offering or in all of that and I think there's, there's a great opportunity actually uh, in, in airlines today in India to bring that sense of experience back into consumers uh, lives and, and to be able to generate a premium for that and sustain over a long period of time, so yeah. No, thanks for sharing that, Siddharth. Yeah, uh, uh, I mean, something to think for, for the airline category, definitely. Uh, but moving over to you, Girish, um, uh, what do you think about it? How do you um, build a purposeful brand, still kind of manage your um, business numbers that you know, you, you're bound by year on your quarter on quarter, month on month? Hello. Yeah. So, so basically, uh, you know, there's uh, what I'd like to differentiate is between brand promise and brand purpose, right? Brand promise is typically a USP, which is a value proposition, which is why by me. And uh, brand purpose is much larger. It's something what you stand for. Now, it's very clear that a brand promise would be easier to kind of communicate to the customer. Uh, it can be short term as well that this is my reason why you need to buy me today. Uh, you know, for example, in my category, which is air conditioners, you buy me because of fast cooling. Uh, what do I come up with a purpose? But I have an example there that, you know, some years ago when we uh, launched our social media, uh, you know, uh, handles, which was about 2013 or so, uh, we just didn't want to be one more brand which is talking about the same thing, right? That by me, because I give you energy efficiency, I give you cooling, I give you fast cool and, you know, things like that. I, I, we realized that we'd have to go, uh, you know, take a little higher ground because you're obviously engaging with uh, consumers who are far more savvier in those days. And therefore, we came up with this proposition of cool my world, 
which is uh, like a brand purpose. Uh, I cool you physically, like you know, this, this uh, hotel is cooling you right now, but how do you cool yourself mentally? Right? And, and that particular Instagram, you know, a Facebook account, etc., spoke about tips on anger management, you know, stress management, travel trips, how do you actually just get away and, you know, uh, get back to your normalcy, yoga, meditation, so on and so forth. Correct? So you could do that, but, but uh, you know, so Cool My World became, you know, we're still continuing with it, we're persisting with it for the last eight years. But if you really ask me, yes, it's always a dilemma. How much do I invest in that versus my you know, brand promise with Virat Kohli talking about fast cooling, right? That's a purpose. Our purpose is consistent. It requires a lot of effort. It requires, like Sagar rightly mentioned, you can't do it short term. You can't stand as a brand today for this purpose and move on next year. It's not a one night stand. You've got to stay invested in it. And the, one of the main reasons I think, um, as marketeers, uh, you know, Sagar gave an example, there are very few brands uh, who have kind of stood for a purpose and been successful with it. Uh, there is, of course, uh, you know, Daag Achhe Hain which is a classic example. It's not about mea, you know, why my detergent is better than yours. Meri kameez, tumhare kameez se kaise. It's about stains are good. And that was a purpose, right? They took at a higher ground. They didn't get into any societal, uh, environmental route from that perspective. They didn't talk about CSR. All they took was a very simple emotion, uh, you know, about kids playing and loving to play in the dirt. They took that emotion very brilliantly and they stayed invested with it till date, right? Now that is the power of brand purpose. And today, for sure, Surf XL stands out uh, because of that purpose that they stood for. So yes, in the long term, it can have huge impact. Uh, clearly, when everything is getting commoditized, like he mentions, you know, consumers, there's a lot of research uh, which says that consumers tend to prefer a brand uh, who has a purpose, you know, whom they resonate with, whom they inspi get inspired by, as I may say, right? Uh, you had Tada T talking of Jagore. They stuck with it. They stuck with it for a long period of time, right? Again, that was not about how good the flavor of the brand is. It's about wake up, you know, and, and they took it very powerfully. So the fact is, I think as marketeers, we're becoming very impatient. As marketeers, we are not really looking at the long term. We, we are looking at short term gains. I think we need to stay invested for the long term. And believe you me, if we were uh, to invest for the long term, it will build the brand powerfully. So yeah, I think that's the dilemma, honestly between brand promise and brand purpose, and where do you kind of draw that line? Can you just convert your entire brand promise into brand purpose and still get your uh, you know, annual targets met? Well, that's, that's a challenge. That's the reality of life, right? Yeah, and the other challenge that I feel, and Ajay, I'm going to talk to you about this, is that what comes, I think, to my mind is when you want to build something which is core to your brand, which is so intrinsic, which is something long term, it does, doesn't become the responsibility of a few people in the marketing team to do it, right? Everybody should own that brand purpose. So how do you make sure that hundreds and thousands of people who work in large organizations, you know, kind of uh, align themselves to that brand purpose? So Ravina, if you'll allow me to pull back first and talk about purpose and uh, uh, business. Uh, I think purpose is not something that you decide on. It's not something you come upon. It's what you're born with. So very often they ask, uh, can you be a born actor or can you become an actor? I'm saying you cannot become a purpose-led company. You are either born with it or you're not, point one. Point two is if it is to support your product directly, and we are very good with surrogate advertising, so indirectly, to me it's not purpose. It is surrogate advertising to sell. And some of the brands you mentioned to me are surrogate advertising. Three is if it is with the intent to attract customer attention or to become closer to him for a higher calling, I think it's not a purpose. So therefore, if you ask me, you run your business the way you believe it's right for a customer and you have a purpose which is right for the world at large, the society at large, and my last comment is, you have to make the two meet. If the two do not meet, you will not have a sustained business model. So I'll give you an example. If I decide I want to do everything environmentally right, and that means my cost of production goes up 10 times, but my cost of sale cannot go up 10 times, I'll go bust. So therefore, while it sounds wrong, your purpose has to, I'm saying it sounds sacrilege, it has to have an economic sense to it. But it has to be what you have to be born with and not create around your product. So I can give you Aditya Birla group example. We believe in helping the underserved, 
or the unserved. And that's part of our generational values, irrespective of which business you are in. Yes, what we do is we adopt people and localities around our plants. Because if we can do something for them, that area sustains itself, and those people prosper, those people get a new lease of life. And when employees, to take your question, when employees see you delivering on it because, and irrespective of, they start following that. In our CSR budget, we have a separate quota only for employee-led causes. If an employee believes in a cause, he gives his time, he gives his own effort, he gives his own money, we will also back him. So you have to walk the talk where the employees believe that this is not a catchphrase, it's not a tagline, it's not an advertising slogan, it doesn't change with the times. That's how you rally, I think, employees. Correct. Correct, correct. But you know, coming back, uh, you know, to what you said, and I'm going to throw this open to uh, the Pali. The real fact is that, you know, uh, like you rightly said, Ajay, brand uh, purpose cannot be at odds with what your marketing objectives are. They have to be aligned, and they have to somewhere uh, coincide. You know, over a period of time. And the Pali, then uh, the challenge is always there, right? How do you measure effectiveness? Yeah. I mean, somebody's going to question you at the yeah. end of the day. You know, I think, uh, you know, taking forward what Ajay said. A lot of the brands may not communicate the brand purpose. Or let's say you want to call it company mission or company values, right? They may not always communicate that. But is the brand purpose the moral compass inside your organization? And that gets tested sometimes in times of when you have to take a short-term decision to let go of profits. In the short term, that may not seem like an economically viable decision, but in the long term, it is necessary for the company's survival. And pharma companies display that, right? They do product recalls when they go wrong, right? And we've heard of famous cases such as, you know, J&J doing that, and that's ensured that they win the trust of the medical community, you know, uh, in that sense, right? So one is, look at the brand purpose, whether it is the moral compass of your organization, of course, it aligns with the brand, uh, uh, you know, overall uh, schema of things, and they are not contrary to each other. But some of the brands may not communicate it actively. Uh, and I can tell you that at IBM, we may not. You know, for example, internally, we talk about the brand's purpose being about being essential. Now, that's a line that you will not hear outside. You know, we don't externally communicate that line, right? Uh, but whatever we externally communicate has to be in line with that. Now, how do you measure it is the question that you asked, right? I think ultimately you're measuring the effectiveness of the brand in the context of, of course, you have those, uh, you know, brand relevance scores and, you know, uh, preference scores and stuff like that. You also get measured by the stock market and the stakeholders in the way, you know, your, uh, uh, how you're doing uh, on the stock market. You get measured every day because, you know, your turnover, your market share, you know, wallet share, whichever way you look at it. The only thing is you may not be able to isolate the impact of each one of those elements. Ultimately, to a customer, whether in the B2B space, where, you know, we're doing deals worth, you know, let's say $200 million, or whether you're doing in the B2, uh, you know, C space, where it may be a $1, uh, you know, ticket item that you're talking about, ultimately, it's a bundle of benefit that you're offering, right? And over a long period of time, if you stay close to the brand purpose that you've defined, because uh, that ensures that you provide a certain degree of quality, that ensures that you stand for certain things and you will be a, you know, uh, you will ensure the CSR element, for example, that Ajay was talking about and we, we look forward to that, that gets delivered, uh, you know, uh, uh, to the end customer. So to my mind, the measurement will happen over a long period of time. And of course, you, if you want to actually start looking at, you know, the qualitative aspect, uh, you know, we can look at that. And I just want to share one anecdote with you here. I joined l and Insurance uh, you know, 10 years ago. And one of the things that we did in LNT is not been a B2C brand. You know, with insurance, we were going to do the B2C work for the first time. And uh, we went out to the consumer to think in the B2C consumer's mind, what does LNT stand for? It was interesting that the first word that it came back with was the first set of study that we did was trust. Okay. And I said, everybody's trusted. Tata's are also trusted. Birla's are trusted. And I remember asking these taking these two names there, you know. I said, what is this trust? How is the LNT trust different from the Tata trust, different from, you know, how the consumer trusts the builders? And I think that's where marketers have a role to play, you know, mm -hmm. to define what is the context of that trust 
and then deliver it consistently, you know, over and over, uh, you know, again to the customer. But to my mind, I still think brand purpose is like the moral compass of, you know, whatever we do inside the organization, not just the marketing team, but I think today, for example, the customer experience team, the whole sales experience, what's happening inside the organization, the way you do pricing, the way you do packaging, the way you write disclaimers, uh, you know, or the way you write the fine print on your packaging, I think all those areas are the ones uh, which eventually will impact, you know, what brand purpose is all about. Okay, since so, we're um, out of time. You, yes, yes, yeah. we're extremely out of time. Yeah. And, so uh, I'm going to just do one, one rapid fire with my two panelists and they will get just one, one sentence to speak. And on that note, we'll close. So, Sagar, one question to you. Like, the, if the Bali uh, said, you know, it's the moral compass and sometimes, you know, they just keep it at IBM inside, they don't communicate externally. Is it even needed to communicate externally, brand purpose? Yes or no? Yeah, I think uh, you must communicate, right? You must communicate. Yeah, yes. You will end that yeah. on that note. Yeah. And so that for you, the rapid fire question goes that if you were to choose between a large purpose driven campaign vis-a-vis -a, -vis a sales driven campaign, which one would you choose? I, I don't think there's a dichotomy. I think a purpose driven campaign will drive sales in the long term. Okay, on that note, thank you very much. I no, think that it was an interesting conversation. Thanks everyone.